Hello, this is David Rovix with another episode of Discussions with David, which is live streamed most weekdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. GMT. We're broadcasting at davidrovix.com slash quarantine on the Facebook pages of Popular Resistance and Cable Community Radio, as well as via my channels on YouTube, Periscope, Twitch, VK, and LinkedIn. You can find all these discussions archived on my YouTube channel in the Discussions with David playlist and in podcast form if you look for This Week with David Rovix on any podcasting platform or go to davidrovix.com. If you have any suggestions for future guests on my show or if you're involved in some way with a social media account, that might be a good place from which to live stream my discussions. I'm very interested in guest suggestions and I have the capacity to add additional platforms to the broadcast. Today's guest grew up in Nigeria, moved to England, became a successful architect, and then threw all his sensible life plans to the wind to start writing and performing plays. His play, Call Mr. Robeson, about the life and times of radical musician, athlete, and linguist Paul Robeson, has won awards and inspired standing ovations from New Zealand to Nunavut. His most recent play, Just an Ordinary Lawyer, tells the story of Nigerian Tunji Sawande, who immigrated to England in 1945 and eventually became the first black judge to work in the UK, albeit part-time. Tayo Aluko, welcome to my little live stream show. It's great to have you here. Great Fine. to be here. Thank you, David. Um, one of the things that can be found on YouTube is part of a tribute to the poet Langston Hughes, and I wonder if you have the poem Harlem handy, which seems especially relevant given the fire rising from Minneapolis at the moment. That's right. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? or fester like a saw and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? It's always that that poem it's it's so short and so powerful huh it's just it's it's wonderful yeah, yeah. you know i mean I, I uh i i wasn't necessarily planning on just getting all heavy right away but i mean it's uh you know it's kind of impossible uh in light of recent events in minneapolis and georgia and elsewhere you know, it's just it just seems like the more things change, the more things stay the same. And, and it occurs to me that uh, that may have been one of your main inspirations in telling the stories that you tell, which are so often, well, actually always about uh, people whose lives are so relevant in light of these ongoing events. And uh, I don't know, I, it's uh, that's that's not really much of a question. And it's, it's just, a, you know, a, a it's, it's, a, it's a statement of, uh, of, of the of, well, it's it, it wouldn't it's not necessarily obvious, but um, it is it is it is what I do. And it is what I was inspired to do just by coming across the story of uh, Paul Robeson. Um, and, when did uh, you first come across that story? Was um, you still in Africa, or is that after you? No, no, it was here in Liverpool, uh, where I live. And this, uh, I remember, I remember it to the day and almost to the minute, because it was it was June twenty third, nineteen ninety five, um, which was the summer solstice, and the uh, there's a park not far from where I live called Sefton Park, and there was a magnificent palm house, a Victorian palm house, uh, which, which by at that time in 1995 had long been very derelict. And the Friends of Sefton Park Palm House had annual fundraisers. And uh, on this day, they invited me to be part of this event. Uh, they called it the Dawn Chorus. Uh, so, so at uh, five thirty six a.m., I was in Sefton Park along with I don't know a hundred other people in this 
palm house, you know, uh, I remember somebody saying, can somebody, can somebody close the windows because all the windows were shattered. Um, and I was asked to sing um, and I chose to sing a particular song that I thought was uh, appropriate. Uh, My Lord, what a morning, the spiritual. Um, and after, after I had sung, a lady came up to me and said, uh, you remind me of Paul Robeson. Do you sing many of his songs? And I thought, ah, Paul Robeson. I may have heard that name, but I'm not sure of his music. And, and that was it. And then two months later, I was in the library in Liverpool. It must have been the American section. I don't know what it was I was looking for, something to do with civil rights, I don't know. But up on the shelf was this book, Paul Robeson. I remember, I recognized the name, I borrowed it, and, and that was it. It changed my life. And uh, as you say, I used to be an architect. I was working as an architect then. And uh, fifth, uh, in 2008, uh, three, uh, 13 years later, um, I ended up giving up architecture to, to start touring the play uh, full time. Full time. Full time is not exactly the right description because uh, I just had a few, a few uh, performances um, certainly in that first year. But uh, it slowly built up, and uh, I have since taken it literally around the world, and uh, I'm still performing it. I've done hundreds of performances, and like you, who's been performing for years, um, in my case at least, I just, I just find every single performance an absolute joy. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, well, there's so many places I want to go here, but it's always the problem I have with these interviews. You know, it's like an hour and like, I, you know, I'm always <laughs> feeling like there's just not going to be enough time, but uh, it's, uh, it's anyway, um, the, uh, one thing I wanted to ask about was just like in terms of those uh, that touring and performing, w w how has the recent events uh, events affected your plans for touring? I know I think you had all kinds of tour plans, including coming to the United States. Uh, that's right. I I wasn't due it in the United States until November. Um, one of those has already been cancelled. Um, the next, the one after that is very likely to be cancelled. Um, um, I had several performances in the UK. In fact, I had one cancelled the day before. That was the first, the first one uh, in March. And, but yes, it's 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 the same with all of us. Um, but it's happened to coincide with the time when I wanted to start writing a new play, a third play. And so I have actually just finished uh, the first sketch draft of it. And, uh, and uh, it's, it seems to, it seems to be something that I, you know, if it goes as well as the other two have gone, then it will be a play that I think would be uh, worth performing and worth touring with, and hopefully will be enjoyed and would would um, would do what I set out to do, which is try to share the kind of history of the world as it relates to African history. I mean, the world, the world, the world economic and political system wouldn't be the way it was now without the involvement and the export of Africa and uh, new one is oh, we're having connection issues here okay. sorry Ty I lost I'm you back. for a couple minutes uh, for a couple seconds you're you're okay. you're at um you're you're nearest the router that you can be wherever your router is yeah okay <laughs> nothing to be done then that's fine yeah. um 
Tyle, who who was uh, can who was Coleridge Taylor? This uh, Coleridge Taylor is is the uh, subject of of your of the play that you've just finished, and and it seems like on the, I was thinking also that uh, it's kind of uh, for all the people. I mean, of course, everybody in the world is experiencing this pandemic in so such radically different ways that it's it's uh, you can't make generalizations, but. But it's true that in, in so many places, people are experiencing uh, a lot of uh, difficulty with isolation, uh, even if they have the means to feed themselves and pay the rent while they're isolating themselves. And uh, and mm -hmm. it seems like in, in a sense, like uh, artists maybe have a certain advantage in, in that situation because, you know, you may have been planning on touring and performing, but you can kind of switch gears and write a play uh, with, with that time. I mean, not maybe not everybody can. I know some artists who are really just, they, they have to be performing all the time and if they're not performing they 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 get really depressed and and it, that's a problem for people but but other people can can manage to shift gears and just go into solo mode and write a play and and you seem to have, <laughs> have done pretty well with the isolation yes yes it's it's uh I'm, I'm fortunate in that way and um and and it has worked out and yeah it probably wouldn't have been so easy without the inter if if i didn't have the internet because the, the, mm. the playwriting involves a lot of historical research and um so being able to do that you know from my laptop is has been has been wonderful so yes it's 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 worked out well so your question about samuel coleridge taylor was uh, he was a british composer who was born in 1875 and he died very young uh, in 1912 at the age of uh, 37 but by then he'd, he'd already become a world famous uh, composer not to be confused with Samuel Taylor Coleridge who was a poet from the 17th century I think excellent uh, but Samuel Coleridge Taylor's um father had been born was from sierra leone and he'd studied uh medicine in uh in Eng in england and had a what seems to have been a, a brief affair uh with a woman in london uh an english woman in london and then gone back to freetown without even realizing that his girlfriend was pregnant so Samuel and his father Daniel Taylor never met. Um, so Samuel Courage Taylor's most famous work is Hiawatha's Wedding Feast, a big choral uh, um, cantata. And Daniel Taylor had another son in, in Freetown called George Taylor. And George found out sometime in his adulthood that Samuel Coleridge Taylor, Coleridge was initially his middle name, uh, but it became Coleridge Taylor as a surname, and he found George found out that uh, Samuel Coleridge Taylor was his brother, half brother. So he changed his name to George Coleridge Taylor, mm. and his one of his his first son was also called George Coleridge Taylor, and it is he through whom I tell the story of Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Uh, so I'm inventing the fact that George Coleridge Taylor, my character after retirement as a diplomat for the Sierra Leonean government, decides that he wants to sing. He wants to compile a concert of his uncle Samuel's uh, songs. But he's That's doing this. Vehicle. The, mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's doing this in the context based in Freetown of a country that is emerging from a terrible civil war. Uh, and then the causes of the war, which you can go back through the various uh, governments that Sierra Leone has had to the colonial era, to the transatlantic slave trade and before. So it's that whole package that I'm trying to tell uh, through with, with the songs of Samuel and his daughter, who was also a composer, that I'm trying to package into a, a play with songs. Mm. I can't wait I to see it. Coleridge Taylor of Freetown. It just sounds like I mean, have you know, having only just heard the synopsis, it just sounds like such a powerful vehicle for telling this whole massive story cool. in in a way that could be so easily overwhelming if, if you're just trying to give people facts and information which is just yeah. uh, it, you could just shut down as soon as you hear it because it's just just too terrible to even 
try to take in the scope of the, the horrors that have gone on. And even it's even very difficult to take in when you're just telling the story of one individual, but it's somehow, it seems to me, it's somehow then possible for, for anybody to, to, to identify with it. Was that, is that what, what, I mean, what was it that made you think that this was how you wanted to try to tell stories, like uh, to tell the story, stories through one man plays like you do, like so powerfully? <laughs> Um, well, There's so many other ways to tell stories. You know. That is true. That is true. Um, well, when I finished reading Paul Robeson's biography, I, and I remember it very clearly too, I, I finished it in my bedroom at 1 p.m. on Christmas morning. Uh, I, I live on my own, so there's nothing to get up for Christmas morning uh, in <laughs> 1995. And uh, I remember it's the last one of the last times that there was a lot of snow outside. I just had to stay in bed to finish this story. And I said there and then, somebody has to tell this story. Mm -hmm. And I had never written a play then. I had acted, you know, as an amateur in plays and musicals. Um, but it started off with when I mean, ten years later, it I started writing it myself, having tried other playwrights, and then I I. Um, I wrote several drafts, which started with a six six characters, went up to fourteen characters, and then I was invited to the U.S. to um, uh, in California for for a conference on art songs by African American composers. And the guy who organized it had heard me sing Coleridge Taylor, and that's why he invited me because Coleridge Taylor had been regarded as an honorary African-American because he really inspired African-Americans. And I decided to present my 14 character play read by me to this conference. And that's when it began to feel that it could be a, 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 a solo, solo play. And then, you know, when I came back, I, I was advised strongly to rewrite it. And, uh, and that's how it has, it has come about. But you know, as artists, we are we are blessed. We are blessed by our gifts. I mean, I've I've, I've heard you live, uh, really teach me histories in a song that lasts two and a half minutes that I wouldn't have known. And um, yeah, and I think that those of us who have these gifts, we we feel that we just have to, we just have to we just have to share them. You know, if we feel that we we can do something to help make the world a better place. You know, when I, when I heard you do the, the when, you know, the one man play called Mr. Robeson, it was, I mean, it was an amazing experience for me. It was a fantastic uh, performance and fantastic piece of writing, everything about it. But it also made me want to do the same kind of thing. I just haven't gotten around to it yet, but I, you know, suddenly I, I wanted to also write a one man musical play and, and, and do it, but uh, I haven't, haven't uh, got, you know, haven't gotten well, into that actually yet. I think I will maybe, eventually. Maybe. We'll, we'll collaborate one day. Oh, hey, then it'll have to be more than a one man, or we can just collaborate in other ways too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You do it one day, I'll do it the next. I'll definitely <laughs> need help. <laughs> but yeah. and speaking of collaboration, though, you, you, you've gotten a lot of feedback from other people along the way that has actually, you've done a lot of rewriting of things because of feedback, which is like interesting to hear you talk about that because it, I mean, it's something that happens with lots of us. Uh, but I think uh, there's also so many people who, who are just totally allergic to feedback and, and they just, <laughs> you know, they're usually not the greatest artists though. I, I don't know. What, okay. what do you have to say about that development as an artist for other people and the importance of feedback? Oh, it's, it's, it's crucial. I mean, I, I, yeah, you get a lot of feedback a lot of the time and people say, you know, with Robeson, for instance, people, some people will say, Oh, that was, great. Um, I didn't know that he was so political. I really just know him as a singer. Other people say, oh, we wish there was more singing in the play. Uh, and then somebody else will say, oh, why didn't you put this incident in, you know? Um, but one example of some excellent feedback that I got uh, was in my second play, Just an Ordinary Lawyer, when I have, uh, you know, I wanted to to try to um, tell the story of, of what everybody knows as the Mau Mau Rebellion in Kenya. Mm. So I told, you know, I was 
so you know, you know my character meets somebody who talks about the Mao Mao and um, I think I think I sort of sent that the, a section of that play or that text to a forum that I, I I belong to British and Asian Studies Association and somebody came back to me and said I hope you will consider calling it by its rightful name mm -hmm. The Land and Freedom Army, ah. which is what it was. Wow. And, you know, the play had been performed several times by then. It had been published. But I said, thank you very much for that information. And I changed it. And the next edition of the script has that correction. So um, feedback is good. Not always good. Not yet. always, but sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> The yeah, Mao Mao Rebellion was uh, so so. How how did it became known as the Mao Mao Rebellion? Uh, I always assumed that that was because of, of of something, some kind of geographical or or tribal reference. But it, it the it the group was actually called the Land and Freedom Army. Correct. I, I yeah. never knew that. That's amazing. It, and and it, it's it, like, yeah. it's also like uh, I mean, you know, with so many of these stories, I I struggle with this myself, but I think that with some of the stories you tell, it's more of a struggle actually, because like uh, even just telling the story of the of that rebellion, I mean, even just sharing minor details, they are so horrific. It is so. I mean, it is so mentally scarring, even to know the very minor details about how the British treated the soldiers that they captured, which exactly. uh, you must have to talk about that. And I mean, how, how do you, how do you deal with tell? And, and also I, you know, in the international museum of slavery in Liverpool, you are a featured actor uh, talk, you know, talking about the history of slavery, which is a powerful presentation in there, which I, I don't think I even realized that you were going to be in there when I went to that museum. But um, I mean, your your visage on the screen. But uh, how do, do you do, like, yeah, how do you deal with that? Trying to trying to tell a story and and not completely overwhelm people with the horror of, of the story or maybe, I mean, you know, where do you Okay, let me give you one example. Um, there's a lot of history in, in Just an Ordinary Lawyer. I created a, a character who was like a foil to my, to Tunji Shawande, who was a rather conservative lawyer. But I, I, I created this, a, a character called Lady Williams, who was much more radical and fiery. And, you know, um, Tunji Shawande meets Lady Williams and uh, Lady says, you must read my article in this paper. And then, he, you know, Lady uh, Tunji at one point uh, picks up the letter in the play. Sir, the trend of events in Kenya serve as a stark reminder, if anyone needed, that British colonial British, oh gosh, it's going to be difficult to do this. <laughs> From memory, yeah. British colonialist, um, oh boy. Um, was, it not the, was it not the British who caused the deaths of 28 brave servicemen in Accra for protesting against, for, for protesting in demand of pensions at the promised levels? No, it is not, it is not necessary. Oh, I'm sorry, but basically, in the form of a letter, you can you can uh, you can portray a lot of information which would otherwise be very dry, as long as the letter is not too long. Um, but you know, in that little passage, I had you know examples of British brutality, basically, and and the way that British, the, you know, the, the narrative can be twisted to make the people who are brutal seem to be the victims. Mm, which, which in a way can, yeah. So then you can, you can see how twisted that is to make the perpetrators into victims. But at the same time, you can talk about the brutality in a way that is sort of possible to hear without being completely debilitated. Uh, you know, in a few weeks, months or years, 
there will be a piece of very powerful drama which, which talks about what happened today in your country, whereby a black man is murdered on the streets in view of full cameras. And within a few hours, the president of the United States is encouraging militias to take their arms to go and shoot people who are demonstrating. And seven shots were fired at demonstrators in Louisville, Kentucky last night. I heard one person died, as, you know. Um, I don't that know was it. also, that was in Minneapolis that apparently somebody shot one of the demonstrators and killed someone. And in, in St. Louis, there were seven shots fired. Two people are undergoing surgery right now in hospital. But already, already people are being called looters to be killed because of brutality of one of one on, on one innocent black man and, and the thing is that artists can 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 do really powerful things with a few words with a few songs and uh, a poem uh, and so on and uh, that's why I, I I think that we are should be but are uh, recognized as essential workers because uh, you know, we have the ability to to convey a lot of thought and uh, and and action. You know, inspire action. You know, quite simply through art. Absolutely. And yeah. um, on on that note, um, do you have a greatness in the time of COVID handy? I, oh yes. I, uh, I, I yes. haven't normally gotten my guests to actually, you know, do perform, you know, but because you do poetry, it seems like we can, you know, it's it's easier with with the microphones uh, at hand, you know, because yeah. if you're if you're playing an instrument, it's gonna, you know, it's an, you know, harder, you know, might as well just refer people to the web, you know, <laughs> like find somewhere where you can actually hear the piano, you know, but yeah, you know. it's this is an interesting one because yeah, the COVID situation. Um, a line came to me, and it and it ended up being the very, very last line. Mm. Uh, I'll, okay, I'll just read it. <clears throat> we made our homes in the belly of the beast, the beast that devoured our ancestors and spat them out on the other side of the globe, that stole our gold and rubber, our skills and knowledge, our art and music, our history. It gorged and fattened itself, dressed in unmissable finery and declared itself proudly the empire. It saw its greatness in our puzzled eyes as we stared up the barrel of a gun from all corners of the earth. Its guns were needed still, we were told, to protect us from the socialists and communists. Capitalism, our enslaver for centuries, will liberate us one day. It bought our rulers and continued the quiet theft of our humanity and our dignity as it planted poison and bombs where once there was rice and diamonds. And then the virus came, silent, swift, and deadly. We answered the call to the front line to confront this invisible enemy. We asked simply for gloves, masks, visors, and gowns. As we fell one by one, we finally began to see that what the gentle ones had been whispering loudly had been true all along. We'd been feeding on the beast's excrement, unmindful of the fact that the empire has no clothes. Yes. Yes, and it's just um, the most, uh, it, it, it is the perfect line to end with, and it is just so, <laughs> so very true. And I mean, 
you know, and it, it's so reminiscent of that of that uh, that whole story of uh, what is it, Hans Christian Andersen of the the, em exactly. the emperor with no clothes. Exactly. It's this whole sort of rule by uh, a rule uh, of fantasy. These these uh, people saying everything is uh, the economy is booming and all this, and you know, there's only so many times you can say the economy is booming while the number of millions of people homeless uh, continue to grow. But then at the point where you have so many people dying of disease and the, and so disproportionately depending on their race their profession uh their class it's just yeah. a, it, then it's all laid bare and i want i mean you you you've traveled extensively around many many countries including the united states you live in england uh, what what is your thoughts on the fact that the us and the uk are two of the most devastated countries currently in the pandemic um, well, actually, considering <laughs> it's not it's not a surprise, considering who is in charge of the countries at present. And it's such a tragedy that because of various manipulations, cheating, uh, you know, uh, it could be so much so very 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 different you know um, the virus would have come whatever but if in your country uh, in 2016 um, the Democratic Party hadn't manipulated the uh, primaries and Bernie Sanders was the candidate and I'm pretty sure he would have won and been president right now. Um, things would have been very, very different, you know, to a lot of socialists, maybe not enough. But the, the fact is that there would be there wouldn't be the issue of most people not having access to health care without being able to pay for it. Uh, uh, here in the UK, um, the guy called Jeremy Corbyn was was um, was deprived of winning the election again by some cheating within the Labour Party and outside, um, and a, a, tr a horrendous four or five year long media attack on this man. Who, um, and in fact, uh, you know, that his his story, in fact, inspired part of that poem. Um, we we came to realize that what the what the gentle ones had been whispering loudly had been true all along. Mm. This guy is a man who is there for peace, mm. and the the media just attacked him. And you know, anyway, he lost election. But if he'd be there now, the National Health Service, of which Britain is rightly proud, would have you know the the issue of private you know PPE would 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 not have caused so many caused so many deaths so it could be so different now but the way the media is the way a lot of ordinary people are who who believe that Britain was a great empire we need to bring it back which is why a lot of people voted for brexit other people voted for different reasons but there is, you know, so it's no surprise that, uh, you know, England, uh, the UK and the United States are in such terrible situations now. And Brazil, you know, it's, it's, it's really shocking. But, you know, the fight continues. <laughs> yeah. And then as we talk about how bad things are in the US and the UK with the virus, uh, it's in all likelihood in a few months, uh, the whole situation will be different in i mean hopefully that's not the case and hopefully all these cuban doctors will be able to contain the the, the pandemic in many of the countries where they're very actively and effectively working but if things play out in any way like they did in 1918 then uh and of course like in 1918, the world is full of extreme poverty, extremely densely populated areas with extreme poverty, with lots of people who lack electricity and running water and live in refugee camps all over the place. So we can be uh, fairly certain that the majority of those dying of, of, will ultimately be in 
in those kinds of places, uh, although it has to trickle down because uh, it starts out with people who are traveling by air and co in going to capital cities, and it seems to be sort of filtering outwards uh, in, in, yeah. a, in a different a different sort of w f method of filtering than in 1918 when it was being spread by soldiers returning home from World War yeah. One uh, to their yeah. home countries. But, but I, you know, I mean, the, the research I've been doing for this for this current play. Mm. Um, Did remind you come across 1918 much? Uh, not that, not <laughs> that. But it's just that I'm concentrating on in this play on the activism and the power of women. So I am, you know, when you're talking about poverty and so on, I, I'm reminded of the fact that in many, in many cases in Africa, in the anti-colonialist struggle, um, huge gains were made by market women. Uh, one example was in 1949 in Nigeria, um, in Abel Kuta, a woman called Fumilayo Ransom Kuti, who happened to be the mother of Fela Kuti. Ah, wow. Right. Uh, she led the market women to protest um, uh, taxes that the British, you know, the colonial government was imposing on them. Uh, through the local king, the Ake. Uh, so he was a stooge, and she led a massive protest, which eventually led to the Ake having to abdicate. He had to step down, and the taxes were, were removed. Uh, in Sierra Leone, um, uh, in 1951, I think it was, there was a similar um, demonstration by the market women there, um, because the rice prices were being manipulated by Lebanese traders. And again, that led to them taking over the wholesale of, of the market. Um, now, that, that's a very good example, you know, the, the powerful activism and great results coming from market women in Sierra Leone. Mm -hmm. Soon after that, on independence, they got... Uh, um, you know, various male <laughs> uh, presidents and women have always been largely sidelined in Sierra Leone politics. It is no coincidence that the place deteriorated to such an extent that they had a civil war and remain one of the poorest countries in the world today, not forgetting what happened before independence and how the British manipulated who became in charge of the countries and so on. Um, so I'm just saying all that be to say that scary as it is, and we are, you know, I, it's lucky that, you know, the COVID hasn't sort of blown up in Africa to the extent that one expected. It may do, um, but it's going to be the regular people, especially the women, who are going to help us through this if we give them the respect and the resources and the space to take charge. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. There was something uh, I, I haven't, you know, I, I don't know if it's uh, how much of it is coincidence or not, but it, but uh, there was a story, I believe on BBC actually, about how only 7% of the world's nations are are headed by female heads of state, uh, but, all, but most of the ones uh, that are headed by women um, have in common the fact that, they, that they've dealt really effectively with the pandemic. That's right, that's right. So, you know, I, you know, I, I did a newsletter only yesterday and I, I I said I'm trying to write a feminist play, and that I, uh, so and 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 then I ask I'm going to be asking for feedback because I I want I want people to to be my judge and my guide as I as I write the play to um, you know a, a man um, and I'm going to be I'm going to have at least one female character that I'm going to sort of morph into at some point, um, but it's it's. It's becoming clearer to me, actually, just by doing this play about this this British musician, male, and the fact that his nephew, who I'm the protagonist, who's my protagonist, had nine daughters. So that's where it all started. Mm. 
this should be a play about women and therefore you know it, it became about women's power so it's it's interesting how sort of the mind works and it ends up it ends up on paper yeah it sounds like the process that you hear a lot of people who are writing a novel they 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 don't necessarily know how it's going to go or how it's going to end because as the characters develop uh, the the plot changes that's right that's right you know a, mm -hmm. Before you, before we started, I, I, there's another, um, you know, this all started with me stumbling on the on the story of Paul Robeson in 1995, and um, there is one thing that he wrote in 1946 that keeps coming up again and again, mm. which I'd like to share with you. If that's oh, okay. please, yeah. Um, it's uh, July 29th, 1946. Um, he he sent a uh, he sent a telegram to President Truman, and uh, he says he was chairman of the Council on African Affairs, and he says the Council on African Affairs demand that the federal government take immediate effective steps to apprehend and punish the perpetrators of this shocking crime and to halt the rising tide of lynch law. This was after four men had been lynched in, in Georgia. Only when our government has taken such action, he says, toward protecting its own citizens, can its role in aiding the progress of peoples of other countries be viewed with trust and hope. Yeah. 1946 that's uh six, 74 years ago yeah. and here we are again here so are. You know, that man was uh a prophet and of course he was talking about uh you know i mean you could call him a prophet for lots of good reason but at the same time he's talking about the current reality at the time which is still the current reality which was the current reality in 1918 and 19 you know 26 and yeah yeah 1869 and whatever you know as soon as the union army pulled out of the south i mean there's just uh, yeah 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 and the interesting thing is that you know you know his he, he traces ancestry to uh, the Igbo people of Nigeria. Mm. Um, uh, some of his some of his ancestors would probably have made it to to Canada, um, having fought for the British and ended up in Nova Scotia. Um, and and when they got there, you know that was their reward for fighting for the for the Union side. Um, when they was got, the, have a place to live in Canada or no? Yes, they were, they were, yes, they yeah. were, they were promised land and, and so on. Did they get it? They got it, but it was very cold and it wasn't very, very it wasn't very, uh, it wasn't very fertile. So like a I, two week growing season. But if you're into fishing, there's a lot of fish, <laughs> not a very good place to be a farmer. Neither is Norway, you know, but they're really good fishing. <laughs> right. Um, but then they also, con you know, encountered racism, mm. and so many of, or some of them, decided to take up the offer to go b to Africa, and ended up in Freetown, Sierra mm. Leone. So these links, you know, the, the history is 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 shared, and and it's that, it's that kind of history that I, you know, not not everybody knows that. Um, and this kind of thing that I try to sort of mesh into into a narrative, which hopefully will be entertaining as well as uh, educational. Yeah, and I think on that note, you know, in terms of this, the, these connections with, with the history, with the geography, with the whole African diaspora, the whole exploitation of Africa. I mean, every this it's all so sort of neatly connected in 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 you as a person i mean traveling around the united states as someone from nigeria and performing this play about paul robeson all of that together uh, to say nothing of the quality of the performance in the play but that just who you are doing that work seems to have a particular impact on people in terms of like uh 
understanding the, the connections here uh, that that you're also making in so many ways in the play, but also like in terms of what uh, Paul Robeson himself talked about, yeah. but also like who you are as a performer doing this work. I, I wonder also like, um, you know, just writing songs that as I do about historical events, I often kind of lo get lost in it. And like when I write, I, I wrote a novel once and I, I just, I think about the characters in the novel, even though they're all fictional, like they're friends of mine, you know, and, you know, like, and one of them, I think of as, as I am that person because it was written from this person's perspective, although I am not this person, you know, but uh, it gets confusing and, and a bit weird. And I wonder how much you might have that experience with going around so much uh, performing a, a play about Paul Robeson. Like, I mean, it feels like you're channeling Paul Robeson and I know from experience that some of these these 90 year olds who are in the audience and you get you attract more 90 year olds to your performances <laughs> than anybody outside of an elder care facility you know and that's very interesting too like these people who were young young adults or teenagers in the 1930s some of whom are still alive and coming to your gigs and like when they were in their 70s and i was younger and performing they were frequent that generation frequently came to my shows but now yeah. that they're your 90s they don't come to my shows anymore when i used to do them but they should come to your shows and you know, with assistance walking and whatever but it's really quite something and they have uh they really it, it really feels like they're you're feeding something that they really need you know this connection and they were they they went to hear paul robeson back in the 60s and and they miss him yeah that's right and it's 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 really that's one of the most pleasant parts of the of performing um, I always do a question and answer session afterwards and you know the, the older people you know from their 60s to their 90s would, would tell the stories of having heard met listened to whatever Paul Robeson and um, but as, as you know having seen the play um, I, I channel Paul Robeson from the moment I walk on stage, but I stop being Paul Robeson when I walk off stage and I come back as myself. It is, I have heard of people who live, <laughs> live as the characters that they have written about, uh, which, which uh, I, I would say I'm fortunate not to, not to do that. I mean, I, nobody can be Paul Robeson, but you know, I am I am me, and uh, I think it's rather unhealthy to to uh, to allow such a, a character to sort of uh, uh, take over your life completely. And then the characters that I write, it's not always the case. I mean, Paul Robeson, uh, the you can person. But having written a play about Paul Robeson, anybody else that you write about that I portray will not come close. So it's so it's so it's it's a good thing that I'm not investing myself so in the in the character so much. And you know there are always uh, things that you discover about a person that are not necessarily um, things that uh, everybody would like you know to to hear about nobody's perfect and so you 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 know i don't necessarily I, there's nobody that i i cannot imagine writing and portraying anybody else that i would love as much as paul robeson put it that way he was i mean he he actually he had so many such a wide variety of skills uh, that he it's kind of hard to imagine that one person actually had all those skills. I mean, not just minor level skills, but like really high level. I mean, athlete, m musician, uh, linguist, uh, also in the sciences. I mean, it, just yeah. astounding character. Sportsman, sportsman lawyer, <clears throat> um, orator. Um, and and uh, the, the tragedy that somebody like that should have been so uh, suppressed for speaking the truth. And I, I very often uh, equate him to, to somebody who's suffering similarly today, uh, who's Mumia Abu Jamal. Um, you know, a, a, an incredibly brilliant uh, mind uh, who was framed for 
and I'm pretty sure that's, I, I, mean, I know that's a case, that he was framed for, the, for a murder that he did not commit. Remind and if he had committed it, it wouldn't have been murder, because uh, whoever committed that so-called murder was defending Mumia's brother from a savage beating by the police. Right. So, so it was self-defense. Whoever did that was standing their ground under, right. under current American law. And, he's in, and even if he had done it, he never should have gone to prison for it. There you go. Well, Mumia was on death row until uh, five, six years ago, and is now still uh, uh, in life. Um, but even from within prison, this man is speaking and writing as much wisdom as practically every pundit that you have on on the media in the United States. You know spouts in a whole year he would he would he would he would give a five minute broadcast that has more wisdom and truth than all of them put together but he is so dangerous just by the clarity of his 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 vision and what he says and writes that uh, you know they'd rather keep him keep him back there that's what happened to Paul Robson and hopefully Mumia will will and so many others who deserve to be out and sort of being our, these are our our heroes, our leaders. Hopefully uh, they would remain there for too much longer. It seems that, uh, you know, regardless of all the propaganda the, the, of, of these countries like the United States and the United Kingdom that are always, uh, you know, whose leaders are always espousing uh, free speech and freedom of the press and all this kind of stuff, it's it's just uh, it's fantasy and and words are so powerful and people who have too many powerful words uh, they 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 get rid of them in one way or another and I'm also reminded uh, of uh, of the situation with uh, with uh, Jeremy Corbyn and and in the the British media and how like you know you were mentioning that earlier but it's just astounding words apparently are are much too powerful for the British media to be able to handle because they just completely ignored him. I mean, yeah. and like the way they would ignore all the leaders of, of, of Sinn Féin and the IRA, like never mm -hmm. have them speak. Are their words so powerful you can't even let Jerry Adams say something? Yeah. 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 And in Nigeria, you know, another good example that was uh, Wale Shoyinka, you know, who, who ended up winning a Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, was it Nobel Prize? Uh, yes, Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, he, was, he was in prison for for several years for writing the truth. Thankfully, he's still alive and well in his 80s. Um, Kenya had um, Gugi Wa Thiongo. Um, so we, uh, you know, and it's it's like that all over the world. Um, so, you know, for those of us who are out and able to roam freely, I just mm. consider it our duty to honor all these brave people um, and honor our ancestors by doing what we do um, because they, they they suffered a lot more for it than, than, than we do right now. However, however hard it is, even in, even in normal times, mm. uh, to barely earn a living doing what we do. I mean, for, for artists in most artists, I guess, in, in the, in, in, the UK or the US, like, uh, you know, you're, you're the worst thing that's going to happen to you probably is you'll, you'll just be poor and you'll be ignored uh, yeah. by, you know, that's, you know, and, and if you're lucky, you, you'll, you, you'll make a living and, and you'll have an audience, right? But uh, maybe a big audience, but, uh, you know, it, the worst thing is likely to happen is, is you'll, you'll be just ignored by, by the media. And, uh, but, you know, in a sense, I wonder what is that in terms of the scheme of things? I mean, obviously, it's much better to be poor and ignored than it is to be assassinated. OK, obviously, we'd rather be alive than dead. OK, but yeah. but, you know, the uh, but at the same time, when you're assassinated, you, be, you can you might you might become a martyr if you've lived <laughs> long enough to have produced a whole lot of good art and they're not assassinating you at the age of 17, you know. Yeah you might have uh, actually produced a lot of good work and then uh, you're going to be remembered. Everybody knows who Victor Hara is, uh, or at least not everybody, but a lot of people know who he is, uh, who wouldn't have known who he was, even though he was a brilliant musician, they wouldn't have known who he was unless he was killed, you know? Yeah. 
but I don't know. I mean, it, what it, it, I guess it's worse to be assassinated than than to be ignored. But I but I think um, you know sometimes I think that uh, the the fate of of uh, of a lot of uh, artists in, in, in the West, uh, and particularly in the U.S., where, where there's no government support for the art, and where basically you know you're either going to be a star or you're going to be nobody. I mean, I wonder, what do you think about that conundrum? I am imp always inspired by the story of a guy called Solomon Northup, who wrote a book. Probably was barely. I don't know how much it was read in his time. He died. Um, he, he wrote his life experience, he died, and the book was discovered again in the 1960s, somebody wrote about it, and then, it, you know, and then s several years later, somebody else picked it up, gave it to her husband, and the husband decided to make a movie out of this man's story, and that movie was 12 Years a Slave. Mm. So even if as artists, we are ignored and we are poor and we die, <laughs> as long as what we have produced is good, it is a seed planted, which will wait for the right circumstances, the right amount of light and water to sprout into something beautiful. So that's- uh, That's wonderful. I think I think Joe Hill said something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Did he write? Wasn't that the, or Joe Hill's last will? Actually, it was the last thing he wrote. Was uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonderful, yeah. Yeah, that's what I think about these interviews. Like, even if only seven people might watch them live, you know, when the, when the person I'm interviewing might die in a few decades, they're going to find <laughs> that, and <laughs> <laughs> it'll be up on YouTube. <laughs> If, if, if the planet isn't a total smoldering ruins and we still have uh, YouTube server farms in Iceland, yeah. yeah. And then and then they'll make the links. Who is who was this David Rogan guy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tayo, thank you so much for joining me for this uh, little discussion. It's been a great pleasure. And thank I don't know how where the hour went as usual, but it's it somehow is gone. But yeah, well, there we yeah. go. It's, yeah. it's great, great. Yeah, it's an honor. Thank you very much for asking me. Great pleasure. Thank you. See you again, I hope. And can I get you back to, uh, there, there's, I suspect over the next few weeks, there might be a lot happening in the world for us to talk about. So that's we, true. Yeah. <laughs> Take well, care, Tayo. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I hope you have enjoyed this discussion with Liverpool-based playwright Tayo Aluko. On Monday, I'll be hosting the sixth Pandemic Open Mic Monday. Everyone with a song, poem, or a rant is very welcome to sign up, which you can do at davidrovics.com slash P-O-M-M -M, uh, for Pandemic Open Mic Mondays. The Open Mic and my other live stream broadcasts happen every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. GMT. On Tuesdays, the show is Fifth Estate Live, produced by longtime Detroit area talk show host and founder of the Fifth Estate magazine, Peter Werby. Wednesday through Friday, I'm both the host and the producer for Discussions with David. Regardless, it's every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, broadcast on the Facebook pages of Popular Resistance, Cable Community Radio, The Song News Network, and my own channels on Facebook, Periscope, YouTube, Twitch, VK, and LinkedIn. And once again, all of these episodes are archived on the Discussions with David playlist on my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash drovix, as well as in the video section on the Facebook pages of Popular Resistance, Cable Community Radio, among other places. Each episode is put up in audio podcast form soon after it's been broadcast live, which you can find if you look for This Week with David Rovix on any podcasting platform. We are very much interested in broadcasting on additional platforms, so if you're involved with an organization, a network, or any other group that has a presence on social media that maybe completely lacks any kind of live streaming content, perhaps you want to consider having some of that, which I can potentially provide for you for free. It's a pretty good arrangement, I'd say.
Producing and broadcasting this programming every day is not free, however, and either in terms of money or in terms of my time. And if you want to support my live streaming, podcasting, songwriting, and recording efforts, whether there's a global pandemic on or not, but particularly at the moment when we touring performers are not able to tour, please feel free to send a one-off donation to me at paypal.me slash davidrovix or become an ongoing patron at davidrovix.com slash subscribe or at patreon.com slash davidrovix, where all of these episodes can be found in both video and audio form along with various exclusive content that's only available for my patrons such as my 16-part audio memoir whether you're in portland oregon or not if you want to be involved in any way with the rent strike activities here or anywhere else please check out artistsforrentcontrol.org for some of the popular education resources currently up and then come back there in a week or so by which time we should have some more concrete ways for folks to connect in mutual aid efforts to stop the evictions before they start hope to see you again soon in cyberspace and who knows where else mutual aid and solidarity will get us through don't pay the rent Bye-bye for now.